Hello, this is Sarfaz Niazi coming to you from Chicago. I'm happy to have this opportunity to speak to you about a topic just so close to my heart and to the heart of so many patients around the world. Biosimilars have been around for a long time now, and uh, there have been many concepts and misconceptions. But my job today is to share with you a lifetime experience in telling how to get to the market fast. First of all, please know that biosimilars are here. 70% of all new drugs that are being developed are biologic. So you can see that in the future, at least that many drugs will be biosimilars. Even today, we have more than 100 products, 100 biologic products whose patents have expired. And all of them can be a biosimilar. But if you look at the world data, we are chasing down just a handful of those molecules. So one of the teaching right up front is don't chase down the popular ones. There are plenty of opportunities available to you to think differently. But you know and I know that developing biosimilars and taking them to market is a lot more expensive than doing chemical generics, a lot more complex. So my idea is that if you, you may develop it locally, but only with the mindset that you're going to sell it globally. It's not going to cost a lot more than if you only have to comply with your domestic guideline. And I'll tell you about that in my next slide, why. But before you start, okay, you must develop a very detailed plan how you want to do this, okay? And that's where many companies have missed out and go into redundant retesting that is totally not necessary. Biosimilars guidelines, you started with Europe and now most countries have them, and all these guidance fall into four categories. I call it FDA EU, even though they have differences between them, but more or less, I think they follow the same approach. WHO does not actually have a guidance that is legally um, enforceable. They don't have any legal authority, but they have provided a very detailed process of how to develop biosimilars. And in this talk today, I'll tell you how many things are wrong in the WHO guidance that you should not follow. And there are countries uh, like India itself okay, has its own guideline. And I think uh, my reviews tells me that uh, such guidelines are not the best one to follow because they will not allow you to get into the global markets and then there are some countries who decided there's no guidelines required. There's no guideline required. These are chemical generics and they are biological generics. So to be a biosimilar, okay, I think, let me take you on the right-hand side here, okay. If biosimilars are biologically similar. I coined this word especially to make a sense that these are biologically similar, not similarly biologic, okay, which WHO and India and many other countries do, causing a serious uh, misconcept about it. These are not just a similar product, these are biologically similar, and that's a big difference. These are also not chemical generics, as many agencies will say. So in my opinion, creating your own guidance I think will always result in a compromise that is not necessary. Uh, in my books, the first book I wrote I was, uh, uh, I called it the uh, biogeneric, uh, hoping that you know that will stick, but there was a legal reason why they will not uh, uh, possible. Uh, but you can see a lot of these uh, guidelines and advice I have available in many of my books on the subject. So obviously it has to have a same molecular structure same mechanism of action, same route, same route. Uh, in other words, 
if there is a, a change from subcutaneous or IV to subcutaneous, uh, you cannot use this for biosimilars. Indications must be same. You're not allowed anything new. Dosing should be same. So you cannot have anything quote unquote bio better or something that has a better response to go in there. You can have a different formulation, yes. But in the end, you must demonstrate uh, no clinically meaningful difference, which really simply means that have the same safety and efficacy. So here's a uh, simple questionnaire for you. Do you know that it takes more science to develop biosimilars than new biologic? Because here you have to follow a very narrow path. In a new drug, you have what you have. You go through phase three, phase four trials and you prove safety efficacy. I'm not saying it is easier, I'm saying it's less complex, okay? In biosimilars, you have to follow the same path. In fact, sometimes I say, you know, that it has to be just as bad as the reference product. Very difficult, but it requires more science. It's not difficult, it requires more science. And that's why you're not going to see a lot of competition because many companies who are classically chemical genetics don't have the depth. They will never have the depth or understanding of how to make biosimilars. Always when you talk about the cost of development, please know that this is always a function of time. If it takes you three years versus seven years, you know where the cost is going, okay? So in, instead of saying, you know, uh, um, low cost to market, I always say fast to market. If I can get you there faster, this also has cost you less, okay? Uh, now, I have come to realize that there are some basic misconceptions about uh, most people are, are pushing for higher expression cell lines. My experience has been very different. When you push the cell to express more, it's likely to produce a product which is more variable, not a very good thing to have. And when you do all the calculations, because the cost of the product is based on the amount of carbon you put in or the media. So really what a high expression line does, okay, it reduces the size of bioreactor, that's all. At what risk? At the huge risk of giving you a non-compliant product. So don't rush into high expression cell lines uh, as the only solution to reduce your COGS. You can also ask now for not doing efficacy study, and I will show you the reason why it is possible. And that will save you significant time, but you have to ask. You, they're not going to give it to you if you don't ask. Also, um, there are a lot of novel technologies coming in, except for single use, okay? Uh, I want you to stay away from it, okay? Because anything that is not widely known in the uh, regulatory agencies, okay, will always take you longer to um, to develop and to secure. There are more than 100 products available which have a very low IP risk. Uh, I don't know why most companies are not choosing them, uh, but I think there are many opportunities which are unearthed that I want you to look into. Also, uh, it's not a big uh, pride to be number one. Number one is not the smartest person. No, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, number one will be the person who is very smart and has a lot of money. Okay. I want you number two, number three. There's a plenty of opportunities for um, competition. Okay. They're not going to be 10 companies selling the same product. So you will always make money if you have a biologic approved or biosimilar approved in a developing market. So let me go through with what is wrong with WHO. First of all, um, WHO tells you to, uh, tells the agencies to use their knowledge of reference product and other biosimilars to evaluate your biosimilar. Unethical and not at all. This was also the, by the way, uh, the subject of a lawsuit that we had against FDA saying that because you know how we make the product, you're not qualified to judge a biosimilar. I think the most agencies uh, do not do this. Okay? They uh, treat this as an independent evaluation. Uh, I don't agree with this WHO suggestion. They also say that, WHO says that you do, you do not allow biosimilars unless the reference product has been in the market for a long time. They don't tell you how long. 
You know, uh, if a product is approved through rigorous full dossier, I have no doubt about the safety and efficacy. And for them to suggest they don't go into biosimilars unless there is a long history of safety, I think shows the lack of scientific understanding of what a full dossier means. They also go and say things like, you should not apply statistics to analytical data. I don't know how they came up with, which results in the great misconception that how many lots you can use, because if you're not doing the statistics, so a lot of uh, agencies, a lot of uh, countries that are following FDA's advice, if not the guidance, have got into this uh, development cycle, which I think is totally erroneous. They also don't tell you to use an at scale lot, which is the commercial lot to do the analysis. I think it's very important. Um, they also say something which is totally bizarre, okay? They say you can use samples from different manufacturing sites for testing analytical similarity. Absolutely not allowed. You know, every site, if you change the site, you have to go through an ICH guideline uh, to show that the product is comparable. It's not the same as analytical similarity, but comparability. And then they go on to tell you that you should only use non-inferiority testing. Well, there are two types of testing, equivalence testing and non-inferiority. But to make it worse, they said it is okay if the product is more, more, more active, more effective. No, you cannot do this because more effective also means they could possibly have more uh, side effects or more safety issues. EPA and FDA do not allow this. Okay? And they also recommend equivalence testing. So that was a wrong move by WHO. Other thing, is that they said, you don't have to look at the adverse events in the local uh, administration. Now we know we are giving the products to with different formulations and they can cause local reactions. And I think they should be viewed at. They also said that the testing in monkeys should be discouraged, okay? Now, uh, a very interesting part, okay, uh, is that India took it and say, you know, I cannot test maps in monkeys, so uh, the uh, agency said, all right, then do it in rats, okay. which had no uh, receptors. I mean, you can give a ton load of uh, map in a rodent, nothing will happen to it. But surprisingly, okay, I think uh, if you talk about hypocrisy, uh, now the Indian companies who are developing the vaccine are testing in monkeys because they had to. Now, because the CTSC allows you a choice, they're not testing in rodents. So I have a serious issue, you know, I think Indian companies missed out a big deal if they had tested it right in the monkeys in the first place. Also, uh, I think uh, understanding toxicology testing is very important. You don't need toxicology testing. This molecule has been tested as a new drug already, okay? You do the testing to do the comparison, not to establish the absolute toxicity. In some cases, they say you give a multiple of human doses, even though there's no correlation between human dose and animal dose. India says, you know, you give it four or five times the dosing of human. I think this is all absolutely not necessary in my opinion. They also tell you to do pharmacodynamic studies uh, with no relevant receptors. I don't know what useful information it will give, but it is an advice from WHO. Also, I think you cannot use analytical toxicology or animal toxicology to overcome any differences in analytical similarity or if you're using a new uh, uh, chemical in a formulation. Animals do not give you that toxic response that can be proportional to the changes that you're making. Now, the other guidances, which are also uh, have a lot of uh, improper inclusions, for example, in all the guidance, they, when you do the clinical efficacy testing, they don't tell you, okay, how much difference is difference. Um, it's arbitrary, it's, they, they call it based on clinical judgment. And as a result, everyone uses a different range. Somebody uses 20%, some 30%, some 40%. There's no basis for it, okay. So that has brought me to, uh, had big discussions with all these agencies is that 
to, to do the clinical efficacy testing, they have to tell you what is the residual uncertainty to require efficacy testing. In all the evaluations that FDA has done, they have never told you what is the uncertainty because nobody asked them. So I think it's about time that agencies say, okay, this is the reason why we want you to do efficacy study. Then they allow full extrapolation of all indications based on a single efficacy testing. Now, why is testing needed? That's another issue. But to say if there's a difference, then this difference cannot be satisfied in a single clinical efficacy testing. Some countries, Iran, Nigeria, others, you know, they say, you know what? No testing. Regardless of how your molecule looks like, don't test it. And on the other hand, the countries like India, China, and Russia, they say, you know what? Even if a product is approved in US or Europe, okay, we still want you to do it in our local population. And these are market studies, you know, you give it to 100 people, 200 people, makes no sense at all. Okay? I think it's a, just a bureaucratic hurdle they're creating. Um, as I said before, okay, the India uh, waived all the testing because of religion, but they were very happy to do it a vaccine. I don't know where the religion went, okay, but uh, then the efficacy testing based on fixed number, that's what some countries do. Okay? It's all right, give me 100, 100 patients. Why 100? Why not 50? Why not 1,000? No rational given. And then um, there is a, some countries allow you to import the drug substance for local fill and finish, thinking you don't need any of these testings. Okay? I think uh, anytime there is a change, uh, in the uh, process, there has to be a, a, a lot of testing required to qualify the product, okay? And some countries take in a uh, position that, you know, these are just generics. Of course, not correct. So here's a, a quick understanding, you know, uh, FT has an EMA if you combine, you know, there's some products that approve multiple of them, okay? Some are very few, okay? So there is, seems to be a trend of what is the most popular molecule in the market, okay? Uh, as you know, uh, trastuzumumab is the only product that is included in the WHO essential list. So I think we have a lot of data to look at uh, from all these approvals. And here's my summary that we did uh, evaluate all the 27 FDA products as of this date. And I think uh, you can see how diversified the testing was okay. The most important thing was there was no uh, correlation between applications for same molecule. In the case of TRAS2, there were one company submitted 48 studies, other 111 studies. 27 studies that were submitted to FDA, FDA said we will not review it, it's not necessary. In one case, there were eight animal toxicology studies and FDA refused all of them to look at. Um, but in all of these submissions, there was no study that failed clinical pharmacology. In a couple of cases, they had to repeat it because of the wrong or improper protocol. Um, FDA never said what is the residual uncertainty that will require clinical testing. Every developer offered to do it. And you know what will happen? You go to FDA or EMA and say, I'm going to do this in 20,000 subjects. Yeah, okay, do it. I think the, the developers were all big companies. They didn't want to uh, uh, go around testing in, in patients. I guess they needed it for their marketing purpose, okay. Uh, so that was not very good uh, sign, okay. Uh, no clinical efficacy study done failed. Okay, they're all fast, okay. So I have a philosophic argument, okay. If a protocol never fails, then it has two meanings. Either the products were always same, that's why they didn't fail, okay? Or the protocol is incapable of telling the difference. In this case, I think it is both, okay? And I think this is why I'm promoting the idea of not doing clinical efficacy testing because it doesn't make sense. So what are the lessons learned is that, first of all, there's no global consensus on anything as it happens in many of the scientific issues, okay? Um, I do not want you to learn anything from the uh, dossiers of other companies that have received approval, they may have overdone or not done correctly. You have to develop your own understanding. 
Your biggest focus should be on analytical similarity, using novel methods, but keep in mind, okay, a lot of companies have uh, confused redundancy with orthogonal. Orthogonal methods support, not repeat the same following. Okay. In the submissions that I've reviewed, you know, there were half of the study they were repeated were redundant, not orthogonal, total waste. Uh, animal toxicology part of it can be waived. I have no doubt about it. Provided you offer to the agency to do the um, uh, animal PK in larger species to do uh, as a uh, analytical similarity part, not as a toxicology part. Um, you should also design a single healthy subject or clinical pharmacology study that will do all PK, PD, and immunogenicity study as your final study, okay? And then demonstrate that there's no residual uncertainty. Therefore, there's no clinically meaningful difference. Now, in terms of planning, okay, you, you can all get a free advice from FDA and EMA. So if you have a plan, but this will only start after you have a proof of having made the molecule. Okay? You, you're not gonna walk in there and say, what do I do? So, uh, do, and these data can then be used uh, and they will give you in writing, okay? How to develop your product. Um, don't be get discouraged by competitors. There are plenty of um, opportunities out there. Uh, you can keep your cogs low uh, by not introducing novelty or by not introducing high uh, yielding cell lines, okay? They will cause problem only, okay? Um, uh, to understand where we are today, okay, we must learn these lessons, okay? So that we don't waste time in getting the products approved. So fast to market, again, select a product that is available, but not the most popular product. Uh, be number two, uh, create a good development plan in consultation with FDA, even though you're not planning to file there, uh, no novel methods, no high expression cell lines, uh, don't learn from others, um, no animal talks, uh, single study, and challenge clinical efficacy study always. Uh, create a global dossier. As I said, don't go for a local dossier because it just doesn't help you. I think the amount of money you're investing in time, okay, you should be able to sell globally, in my opinion, okay. Uh, a development master plan is where you have the most uh, of the time should go in, in, in developing it. It doesn't have to be a very expensive exercise, but this is where I said you need more science than uh, required for new drugs because you're trying to prove it just as good or as bad as the uh, reference product. Uh, and then finally, the decimate the dogmas. I think you must make commitment to quality and part 11 compliance. I don't want you to get a warning letter. Okay? That's really sad. Um, you need to uh, start cultivating young creative minds. I think after a while, what happens, most people who work in the industry, they keep telling me that, oh, this is an industry standard. And you know, when I hear this, okay, I said, well, you're done. Okay? You're no longer a creative person. Who makes the standards? Okay? I think we are here to break the, uh, decimate the dogmas and create new standards, okay? Um, have an open mind. Uh, your team may say, oh, we know everything. I think that's where you, you know you're going to go down, okay? Nobody knows everything. Uh, again, time is of essence. Uh, if you can get it in the market faster, that's where your biggest ROI comes, okay? And stick to a long-term plan, okay? Once you invest the money, uh, make sure you have a long-term plan to make not only one, two, but maybe dozens of biosimilars that I want you to market globally. And again, the key is beat the clock. Thank you so much.